<laughs> I'm so sorry. I forgot about those transitions until now. We're going to keep them. We're going to roll with it. Welcome to The Causes of World War One, Part 1, Imperialism and Nationalism. Okay, so from your warm-up, go back through your World War One history handbook that I posted on Schoology. Come up with two long-term causes, two short-term causes, and explain how they're connected in some way, whether that's similar countries, different main players, whatever that looks like. Just let's start finding some connections and cause and effect relationships. Here are your essential questions. I used to not believe in giving students their test questions from the very beginning, but I have since learned, mainly because of COVID, that you actually do 100 times better throughout the year if I just give you everything that you deserve up front. So here you go, here's your test questions. You'll see a little surprise, surprise one at the very end where I ask you to compare and contrast uh, the relationship between imperialism, nationalism, and then the necessity for alliances. So be ready for that one as well. All right, so as we discussed in our first World War I lecture, and as you saw in your warm up a few seconds ago, here's some potential long-term and short-term causes, but you can, can, you can attribute all causes of World War I using the acronym MAIN, militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. However, you can further subdivide MAIN into these short-term causes that have to do with the rising tensions throughout Europe due to rapid industrialization. Now, because of that industrialization, there's going to be two new social camps of thought that are going to quickly emerge in order to replace the, the dying feudal monarch system. Think modern day capitalism, socialism. And socialism at the time wasn't the way that we think about it now. It was more of like a workers' rights and protections, and I'm going to keep referring to this over and over. So think about it. You like having a weekend. You like knowing that your arm's not going to be cut off in a machine, things like that. Now, eventually, socialism does branch off into communism, and we're going to talk about that way too much in the coming months, so look forward to that. But first, I want you to think about feudal lords and how that's starting to fall apart in this old monarchy. Think Robin Hood. Men in tights, tights, tights. Okay, if you haven't seen that movie, stop the video. You got some other more relevant homework to do. Okay, so each country competed to show that they were doing their very best and that they were better than everybody else and that other countries didn't have the right to control those individual futures. That means Germany thought the Germans were the best and destined to control the world. Same with Britain, Spain. You get the idea. Now, this dude, Archduke Ferdinand, and his wife were shot in the face by a Bosnian, Bosnian black hand nationalist. And that, yes, that's the short-term trigger that starts World War I because those alliances were already formed and people were ready to prove their militaristic might on the battlefield. But essentially, that's just a really small reason as to why World War I actually took place. Those transitions are literally brutal. I'm sorry. Okay, so the problem with Maine isn't so much this individual component of nationalism, right? Nationalism isn't a bad thing. Nationalism is a very good thing, except for when it gets carried away and it's combined with things like imperialism. Now that is, imperialism is always problematic on its own. Uh, you're gonna see where this gets in dangerous territory as it gets defined with militarism, etc. Now they start creating in their altogether main sense, this idea of hyper competition. As things are starting to industrialize all throughout the world, now they're competing for a limited set number of resources. Nationalism during this time of the 19th and 20th, not that it's changed that much since, but it's really focusing on a common language that all residents speak. Now that's exactly how Germany and Russia lay claim to these ridiculously large land masses because all they have to do is look at the roots of their language and say, yeah, that's a Germanic language, those are our people, we should control them. Now, the Ottoman Empire is going to begin to crumble. The Ottomans used to control all the way North Africa, all the way uh, west through Spain, and it slowly crumbles under its own weight because as all empires have been known to do, they get too large and they have to collapse because they can't control the population. Think back to AP Gov, shameless plug, and Brutus, right? He says that when the uh, nation gets too big, it has no other choice but to collapse, and that's what he predicted for the United States. Well, he was right when it came to the Ottomans. Everyone wants a piece of the Ottoman spoils. The Balkans and the Middle East are really rich in national resources, <coughs> oil, and they look like ideal located seaports that allow for further domination of imperial desires. 
And all you have to do is add up all these new racist justifications of imperialism known as social Darwinism, and nations see it as their divine right to expand beyond their national boundaries. In order to spread and show your country's superiority, you then have to develop large militaries, known as the Germans, as well as politics, and we'll talk about that later. And the larger your nation, the more resources you need, the larger military you have, the more resources you need, the more friends you need to have. You get the idea. So nationalism, you're trying to prove that you're the best because naturally it's your divine right to control everybody else's resources. But what creates a world economy, especially during this time period? Well, mainly the rise of the second industrialization. It's linking the mother country to these various resources throughout the world. And Britain starts this idea, which is so ultimately ironic, called splendid isolation. They say that they don't have to play in the sandbox with the other children of Europe because they're isolated and they just want to control as much of the globe's resources as possible without sharing those resources to other countries. Now, other countries are obviously looking upon, across the pond and the entire globe, and they're seeing that this land grab is a huge threat to themselves and those limited global resources. So they all jump on board. There's a ton of hoarding of land and resources for everybody's own interests. But what does imperialism actually require to be effective? Money and military. Friends. Maine. All right, so take just a second and just kind of, I want you to start linking HOA a little bit from last year. What were some of the themes and different phases of growth for the United States throughout these different listed time periods? Check out those little shaking hands. I'll actually look like this for you guys <laughs> on the side who's trying to shake their hands. And why? Why is the United States across the pond such a key player when you're going to look at some maps here in a second and there's not really America listed in a lot of those colonial acquisitions. So what's going on? What's the origin, purpose, content, context, values, and limitations for a historian who is studying this time period? Do take notes. I'm not joking, because we are going to talk about it next class. All right, so what is imperialism to the actual occupied people? Exploitation. There's no respect or regard for native populations, and the Europeans brought in their own industry. They used the natural resources, they used the labor, they destroyed the original economies that were pre-existent and successful, and they used the land, natural resources, for everything that they could possibly be worth. The imperializers subdivided the living populations by a class system that they often categorized by race or ethnicity, religion and gender, and then they started to pit those different historical societies against each other. That pitting of different groups is going to have lasting violent consequences for hundreds of years. We're going to talk about that more as we get into our Cold War unit, and if you turn on the news today, you could probably make some predictions on who was colonized countries and what happened within those systems if they're having a lot of kind of ethnic conflicts. Now we call this system the protectorate system of government. This photograph and the next set that I'm going to be showing you were photographed by Alice Seeley Harris. The man, see, the man who's seated there, his name is Nasala. And here's a part of Alice Seeley Harris's account from her book, Don't Call Me Lady, The Journey of Lady Alice Seeley Harris. He hadn't made his rubber quota for the day, so the Belgian appointed overseers had cut off his daughter's hand and foot. Her name was Boali. She was five years old. All of this filth had occurred because one man, one man who lived thousands of miles across the sea, one man who couldn't get rich enough, had decreed that this land was his and that these people should serve his greed. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up watching Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book, Disney. Rudyard Kipling was born in England in 1865 and he died in 1936. He's the one who authored The Jungle Book in 1894, which is also the same year that Britain took over Uganda as a protectorate. 
Next class, I'm going to have you read another piece by Kipling called The White Man's Burden. So until then, I want you to just take a few minutes and reflect on this children's classic. He took his place at the Council Rock. When the pack met, and there he discovered that if he stared hard at any wolf, the wolf would be forced to drop his eyes. And so he used to stare for fun. Even Bagheera, one of his closest friends, cannot hold his gaze for long. Mowgli looked at him steadily between the eyes. The big panther turned his head away in half a minute. So in 20th century world history, we talk a lot about perspective and how history changes over time. That's pretty much 90% of what we do in this course. But how does that work? If facts are facts and the facts themselves don't change, we know who won, we know who lost, we know the years, we know how many people died, whatever. We take the time more recently to start adding in the lived experiences of the residents during the conflict. We look at the literature, we look at the primary sources, we look at who lost, we look at the changes in land, we look at social and economic motivations, and suddenly that kind of reframes the way that we look at those facts that we've always known, but now we're seeing it as why, not what. Historiography is always why. So back to imperialism, by 1900, 10 major Western nations imperialized almost all of Africa, Southeast Asia and India and the South Pacific. Now, don't worry, that little area down there of South America and Central America, Central America, yeah, that was colonized too. It's just the Europeans lost their control before 1900. And what was all this major mercantilism over? Well, mainly rubber, gold, coffee, teas, spices, ivory, sugar, alcohol, fruits, money. So Otto von Bismarck that you'll remember from our class discussion, he saw himself as the honest broker. He originally wanted the imperial battlefield to just be left to essentially the, the United Kingdom. But it was quickly being taken not only by the UK, and he started seeing much more competition over those resources, especially in Africa and Southeast Asia. And he knew that he was going to lose his control of Europe if he didn't control the conversation. He's keeping himself the honest broker, broker of European conflict by entering the imperial game. Belgium, at the same time, with this guy on the left, uh, who's King Leopold, they also wanted to be part of the uh, European Conference of Colonization. And they're seeing, especially uh, the UK and France, started to take such large possessions over Africa that he sends the guy on the right, Henry Morgan Stanley, to check out any sort of potential colonies or land grabs. Now, uh, Stanley laid claim to pretty much what you think of the Congo today, the um, DRC, for all of Belgium. And it's often blamed widely for the violence that would quickly follow. Think back to a couple slides before. When it came to colonization, Western powers spent most of their time, time trying to catch up to Britain, who maintained India's riches, South African ports, so this leads to the conflicts that we mentioned briefly before, the Boer Wars. Those were fought over who should control the wealth of the South African lands, the Dutch or the British. It was China who was left to more colonial openings, especially as Britain gained Hong Kong in the Opium Wars. So now Russia and Japan are going to try and to rush into Manchuria, which is pretty much all of Korea and then that whole eastern side of China. In the end, it is whenever you have one entity entering into that new land that they see as easy to dominate, other nations are going to rush right in. And we're going to talk about every single one of those conflicts in more detail here soon. So by World War I, all of the major shipping ports of all of Asia are controlled by Western nations. China, at the same time, is in the middle of a warlord crisis, which is going to lead us into the Chinese Civil War, especially as we get closer to World War II. And the Ottoman Empire has pretty much all but collapsed. It'll continue that collapse until Turkey emerges on the outside of World War I. And the colonizing European nations were ready to fight over all of those resources and nationhood.
And Italy, as we'll study soon, well, they tried. All right, so in this nationalist era of splendid isolation, countries start imposing tariffs on each other, especially their competitor nations that are outside of their alliance. This, we call this protectionism, and it's extremely dangerous because it leads to more land grab of resources because you can't just create everything that you need. Think back to uh, AP Human Geography. You have specialized resources in your own country. You can't com create everything you need for industrialization. You're going to have to branch out to other places to go and get it. This creates this cyclical nature of needing more nationhood to have the gall to go and imperialize other nations, which is going to need larger uh, militaristic intent and, uh, you know, dreadnoughts and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, that's going to lead to the protection of alliances so that, you know, your friends aren't going to take your stuff. Except in this first instance, when in Egypt, the uh, Nile was already controlled by the UK and France didn't want... Uh, Britain to control its section of the Nile because it was situated in Sudan. So they tried to force the UK out of the Nile, and we all know how much more awesome the UK Navy is. It's that bulldog right there on the left. And they told the French poodle, no, you can't have it. So the French went and moved into Morocco instead. And we're going to see the Moroccan crisis here in the future. Now, Bismarck said, one day, the Great European War will come out of some damn foolish thing in the Balkans. And as Palmer's going to tell you in detail, this land is complicated. It's got hundreds of languages, religions, cultures, and they all wanted independence, especially after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. They'd all been part of a larger empire for so long that in this, this uh, time period of nationhood and nation building, they want some of that. The problem is the Russians, the Austrians, the Turks, the French, and the British are bigger, with bigger militaries, and they're ready to fight. Okay, so go back through, respond to the following questions in your history notebook, and we're going to begin class specifically with these questions. See that bottom one that I just added? So make sure uh, that you take some time to be thoughtful. I don't need essays, but like outline. You could even go through and like highlight your notes in different colors, like assign a color to each one of those questions and kind of highlight it that way. Find a way to organize yourselves. I'm literally giving you your first paper too and telling you how to answer it. So take the time to do yourself a favor and it'll make it really easy to study. Um, I'm going to add next class some primary sources that are going to help to kind of underscore each of these arguments. Make sure too that you're looking for counter arguments as you're building some of these, especially when you're looking into nationalism is tied to imperialism. Is nationalism maybe more tied to militarism? So just kind of play with those a little bit and see what you can find.